Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, Not All Antioxidants Are Created Equal, Asked as Anathan, the Antioxidant Powerhouse. My name is Vicki, and I'll be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, with time for a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you do require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. And at this time, all participants are in a listen only mode please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point, I would like to thank Algolif who helped develop the content for this presentation. Algolif is a high-grade microalgae ingredient supplier from Iceland, and their mission is to help solve the nutritional needs of current and future generations through the development and delivery of sustainable, high-quality microalgae products. Astolif, Astaxanthin, is their first step in this journey. Algolif is part of Santa Pharma, an international company founded in 2002 with businesses in food supplements, specialty ingredients, medical devices, and over-the-counter medicines. Santa Pharma is established in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, the Czech Republic, and the United States, with more than 200 employees. And now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Our first speaker is Trigvi Stephenson. Trigvi has a PhD in Microbiology and Genetics from ETH, ETH Zurich in Switzerland. He has a strong research-oriented background and has, and has held academic positions across Europe as a visiting and postdoctoral researcher. Trigvi has published numerous peer-reviewed scientific papers, served on editorial boards, and collaborated on international grant applications consortiums. And at Algolif, Trigvi heads up the R&D and Scale-Up Department, a team of dedicated algae cultivation experts focusing on the production of astaxanthin. The department oversees the continuous optimization of cultivation parameters, contamination control programs, and the company's R&D ventures. And our next speaker for today is Haralder Gardeson. Haralder has a PhD in chemistry from ETH Zurich in Switzerland. He has published numerous peer-reviewed scientific papers and held academic positions throughout his career, and most recently as an adjunct leader lecturer at the University of Iceland. As a quality control manager at Algolif, Haralder oversees the day-to-day -day functions of the analytical, microbiology, and in-process control laboratories. Key responsibilities include, but are not limited to, supervision of skilled laboratory personnel to inspect and improve raw materials used, full analytical breakdown of products, and issuing certificates of analysis for products manufactured on site. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to our speakers. They may begin when ready. Thank you, Vicky. I do hope that everybody reads me loud and clear. Um, thanks, for, thanks to everybody that has joined in. Um, as, uh, as Vicky mentioned earlier on, uh, the presentations will be sent out to you afterwards. But we do have some, some handouts available to you already. Um, a white paper, um, a technical paper that also came out recently on, on heavy metal. Uh, and a review of uh, clinical studies. And you can should be able to find those already. Um, we have a diverse group of people sign up for today's session. And I do ho hope that we can accommodate all of you and find a reasonable balance between in-depth scientific discussion and a broader view of emerging health-related topics. So let me just walk you through the structure of the talk today. This should take about 30-40 minutes from me and Haraldur. 
Uh, and as Vicky mentioned before, it will be followed by a Q&A session. So I encourage you all to submit your questions. Um, I will just move on straight on to the first topic, which is focused on antioxidants and free radicals. In, th in this section, I will try to clarify the relationship between antioxidants, free radicals, and oxidative stress, and its association with numerous health concerns. The terms used to describe this relationship not only include the ones mentioned, but also ones such as reactive oxygen species, singlet oxygen species, oxidative balance, pro-oxidants, etc., etc. So in order to keep things simple, I will try to define the basic concepts behind free radicals and reactive oxygen species and antioxidants and move on from there. So we refer to antioxidative stress as the imbalance between pro-oxidants and antioxidants in favor of free radical formation. The negative oxidative balance elicit stress responses which can, over time, leave our cells and tissues unable to function properly. Oxidative stress accompanies most, if not all, pathological conditions, including cardiovascular, immunological, and neurological disorders, diabetes, and male infertility. And this is actually where the antioxidants come into play by offsetting free radicals and neutralizing them. So a bit more on the oxidative balance. In a normal healthy body, represented by the bars on the left-hand side, the generation of reactive oxygen species and other free radicals is kept in check by the antioxidant defense. However, when the body gets exposed to adverse physiochemical, environmental, or pathological agents, this carefully maintained balance is shifted in favor of pro-oxidants resulting in oxidative stress. So that would be the two figures on the, in the middle and on, on the right-hand side. And this can either be characterized by an insuffici insufficient concentration of antioxidants or relatively high concentration of reactive oxygen species. In both cases, free radical formation exceeds the controlling capacity of the antioxidant defense system, leading to oxidative stress. But so what are free radicals? Well, in the most simple term, free radicals are atoms with an unpaired electron. That means that they're highly unstable reactive molecules. And as mentioned before, the reactive oxygen species is a collective term that includes not only oxygen-centered free radicals, but also some non-radical deriv derivatives of oxygen. And even though reactive oxygen species have some beneficial effects in low or moderate concentration, the excessive level of reactive oxygen species can initiate negative structural and functional alterations of key biomolecules, such as lipids, proteins, and DNA. But where do the free radicals come from, and why would their cellular concentration be generally higher now than it was a few decades ago? On one hand, free radical formation is associated with perfectly normal cellular function, such as metabolism and immune response, and general pathways related to aging and disease. So the first four ones listed on the slide. On the other hand, though, the relationship between increased free radical formation and many aspects of modern lifestyle, so-called lifestyle diseases, has been of particular interest to researchers in recent years. And you can see those ones highlighted on the screen. So on to the antioxidants. Well, simply put, antioxidants are compounds that can donate an electron and thereby neutralize free radicals by inhibiting or repairing the harmful effect of oxidation. The protective antioxidant compounds are located in organelles subcellular compartments or the extracellular space enabling maximum cellular protection to occur. The components of the antioxidant network act in different parts of the cell depending on whether they are water or lipid soluble. For example, 
water-based vitamin C and glutathione protect cytosol and the cytoplasmic matrix. The lipid-soluble antioxidants, so for example vitamin E and carotenoids like astaxanthin, are predominantly located in cell membranes. And if we take a closer look at the antioxidant sources and supplementation, well, the antioxidant defense system of the body is a complex network and comprises several enzymatic anti antioxidants. And these are highlighted on the right-hand side. Enzymatic antioxidant defenses include superoxide dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, and catalase. But there is also a number of non-enzymatic antioxidants, including vitamin C and E, and carotenoids such as beta-carotene, lycopene, lutein, zeaxanthin, and astaxanthin. The dietary intake is an important source of these non-enzymatic antioxidants. They function as the chain-breaking antioxidants in tandem with enzyme antioxidants to temper reactive oxygen species within physiological limits. Low intake or impaired availability of dietary antioxidants therefore weakens the antioxidant network. When antioxidants react with reactive oxygen species, they might be transformed into an antioxidant radical themselves, or so-called pro-oxidants. Although, although the resulting radical has a reduced ability to react with cellular targets, it can still cause damage. The pro-oxidants need to react with another antioxidant to bring the reduction potential and the react reactivity further down. For example, vitamin C and glutathione turn into weak radicals after disarming reactive oxygen species. But this, on the other hand, does not apply to other antioxidants such as astaxanthin. So to summarize this relationship briefly, many aspects of the modern lifestyle lead to overproduction of free radicals, and we need the right antioxidants to supplement, uh, right antioxidant supplements to help us restore the oxidative balance. And actually, with that, I would like to hand the mic over to my colleague, Dr. Harald Karlsson. Thank you, Trikwim. Uh, and as Vicky uh, mentioned earlier, I am the quality control manager at uh, Algalif. And today, uh, my job is basically to answer two questions. The former being, what makes astaxanthin a superior antioxidant? Uh, and the second is how do you select the right ASTA once you've realized it is a superior antioxidant. But if we answer the first question, we first have to address what is astaxanthin. Once I have uh, completed that question or, or, or answered that question, I'll hand it back to Trikve who will talk more about the health benefits and some various formulations of astaxanthin. Astaxanthin, as has been said previously, is a potent antioxidant. It is an effective quencher or neutralizer of reactive oxygen species, such as uh, free radicals as the superoxide anion or hydroxyl radical, uh, but also of singlet oxygen. It can do so in a variety of ways. As Trikwe mentioned, it can, for example, uh, s simply absorb the energy and release it as heat, uh, thereby producing no pro-oxidants, but it can also uh, be altered chemically by these radicals or singlet oxygen, but forming a secondary carotenoid in the process. It also quenches secondary reactive spe species, such as peroxynitrite. Uh, in doing so, it inhibits lipid peroxidation because it is a fatty soluble carotenoid, and thereby, thereby uh, predominantly in cell membranes. So it protects cells and tissues from oxidative damage via this pathway thereby uh, preventing uh, various human pathogens. How potent is potent? Uh, the antioxidant powerhouse, as astaxanthin has been named, uh, for example, in this study, is about 6,000 times more effective than vitamin C in quenching singlet oxygen. This is an in vitro study, so of course uh, in vitro and in vivo are not always comparable. However, this study is quite good because it also shows that it's about fi the natural astaxanthin from Haemothococcus is about 55 times more uh, active than synthetic astaxanthin in quenching these reactive oxygen species. 
there are numerous other uh, articles on this uh, that mentioning that astaxanthin is, is more potent uh, a more potent antioxidant than various others. These four, for example, they only look at beta carotene versus astaxanthin, two very closely related uh, carotenoids. Uh, I won't go into detail of all these studies. What I will try to elucidate, though, is why is astaxanthin better at quenching reactive oxygen species? And to do that, we need to look at astaxanthin on a molecular level next to beta carotene. Astaxanthin is a ketocarotenoid or a xanthophyll technically, which just means that it's a carotenoid with oxygen. It's very closely related to beta carotene. And I always find it useful to link those two together because there's a much more public awareness of beta carotene than astaxanthin. Failing that, you can always go back to vitamin A. Everybody knows vitamins are good for you. Beta carotene is basically two vitamins stitched together. Astaxanthin, very similar to beta carotene, except that it contains two alpha hydroxy ketones on the end rings. Now, these functional groups, they serve to increase the polarity of these end rings. Uh, the, this is an important feature of the potency of astaxanthin because it allows the molecule to be incorporated perfectly into the lipid bilayer. The lipid bilayer just meaning cell membrane. This study, for example, is an X-ray diffraction study showing the effects of incorporation of various carotenoids into a cell membrane. Uh, astaxanthin showed no destabilizing effect on the membrane whereas other carotenoids disordered the cell membrane. Uh, and this disorder was always accompanied by a potent pro-oxidant effect, which you can see on the right. Uh, beta carotene, for example, has a 90% increase in peroxide formation. The only carotenoid sh that showed antioxidant activity in this system was actually astaxanthin. This perfect inclusion of, of the astaxanthin molecule is likely due to the polar end groups. Uh, the hydrophobic chain is embedded in the cell much as the beta carotene molecule would, except there we're talking about the entire molecule. For astaxanthin, the hydrophilic end groups interact with the surfaces of the cell membrane. Astaxanthin is therefore able uh, to quench radical species both at the interior and the surface of the, of the membrane. And these unique properties are likely the reason for the superior antioxidant activity of astaxanthin. Uh, now that I've, I've convinced everyone that astaxanthin is uh, superior on a molecular level, I'll hand the control, uh, controls back to Vicky for a moment. And thank you for that, Haralder. And right now, we do have a quick polling question for the audience, and that should be launching on your screen right now. And the poll question is, have you taken natural astaxanthin as a supplement, and if so, in which form? And as you can see, the options that we have here are A, yes, as a pure astaxanthin product, or B, as a formulated product with other active ingredients, or C, no. So if the audience could please get their answers in, this poll will be closing shortly. And once again, the poll question is, have you taken natural astaxanthin as a supplement, and if so, in which form? So it does look like majority of the audience has voted, so I will go ahead and close this poll question and share the answers with everyone. And it looks like 19% of the audience voted for yes as a pure astaxanthin product, 43% voted for yes as a formulated product with other active ingredients, and lastly, 38% voted for no. And with that, I will hand the presentation back to Trigvi. Thank you, Vicky. Um, interesting results. It seems that uh, I'm glad, I'm glad to see that a few of you are um, already familiar with the many health benefits of astaxanthin. But for the rest of you, um, I'm going to go through the, some of the many health benefits of, of astaxanthin. Um, here we've selected five particular ones, which we'll go through one by one. Um, so we have those related to um, oxidative balance, 
cardiovascular health, skin health, healthy aging, and improved cognitive function. And the final one being muscle endurance and recovery from exercise. So let's start with the first one. Or sorry, yeah, let me first highlight uh, the, the number of studies that have been done on astaxanthin and clinical trials in particular. The medical research on natural astaxanthin is rapidly growing, and the beneficial effects are reported in more than 50 human clinical studies and further supported by many studies in vitro and in animal models. Um, as you can see from the numbers, 93% of the clinical trials uh, do indeed use natural astaxanthin from Haemotococcus pluvialis. And those are actually the studies that we've chosen to highlight for the five um, health benefits that I mentioned before. Um, although in those studies, astaxanthin has been used as a single ingredient, but it's also important to mention that astaxanthin has also widely been studied in combination with other nutrients. And with that, let's move on to the first one. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, when the oxidative balance is disturbed, the cellular components are not protected against oxidative radical effects because of the impaired relationship between the activity and the intracellular level of endogenic antioxidants and pro-oxidants, which can result in toxic damage, disease, and premature aging. Park and colleagues performed a study in 2010 and found that astaxanthin decreased oxidative stress and enhances immune response in young, healthy females. Uh, the plasma level of a particular oxidative stress biomarker, and this is highlighted on the graph on the left-hand side, decreased in both astaxanthin groups. And this was a 12 and 8 milligram dose. On to the cardiovascular health. Um, in general, free radicals may oxidize the fat in the blood therefore contributing to adverse cardiovascular conditions. Clinical studies, including the one highlighted here, demonstrate that astaxanthin supplements can prevent oxidative damage of fat particles in the blood, improve lipid profiles, and promote better flow in capillaries. And by lipid profile, we are referring to low density and high density lipoproteins, triglycerides, and total cholesterol. The study by you, Yoshida and colleagues found that astaxanthin supplementation improved the lipid profile, and in particular, astaxanthin increased the serum uh, adiponectin, a hormone regulating metabolic processes, including glucose regulation and fatty acid degradation. And this is highlighted on the graph, as you can see, with three different dose sizes. For the skin health, um, an interesting and emerging topic, well, the skin is constantly directly exposed to air, solar radiation, environmental pollutants, or other mechanical and chemical factors, which can induce the generation of free radicals. Because the skin functions as a protective barrier between the body and its surroundings, the load of free radicals is higher in the skin compared to other organs. This study by Tomi Naka and colleagues demonstrated how astaxanthin improved skin elasticity, moisture, and reduced hyperpigmentation, wrinkle formation, and collagen breakdown over the course of eight weeks. In this case, the application was via dietary supplementation and topical application of six milligrams of astaxanthin. As for the healthy aging and improved uh, cognitive function, well, aging is, a, is commonly defined as the accumulation of oxidative damage in cells and tissue with advancing age. Young cells are protected from free radicals by balanced activity of the mitochondria, efficient antioxidant and DNA repair systems, as well as active protein degradation machineries. Aging, on the other hand, is accompanied by mitochondrial dysfunction, leading to increased free radical production which in turn leads to overloading of the defense systems and to oxidative damage of cellular components. And that is why our body accumulates oxidative damage as we age and we become more susceptible to certain health conditions. 
The study that I've chosen to highlight by Kadagiri and colleagues found that astaxanthin improved cognitive function in healthy seniors and improved the short-term spatial working memory and increased accuracy. Using a standardized learning test, the results highlighted, um, the total number of errors was reduced with a, with a 6 or 12 milligram astaxanthin dose compared to a placebo. And so finally, on to the benefits related to um, muscle endurance and recovery. Heavy exercise is energy dependent, as people know. So when the muscle burns calories by oxidation, free radicals are formed as a byproduct. Free radicals then can damage the muscle and reduce their ability to contract. It has been shown that athletes have increased free radical levels in the blood and lower level of antioxidants. The associated oxidative stress is implicated in the development of muscle pain, weakness, and fatigue. In this 2012 study, Jorovitz and colleagues found that astaxanthin supplementation reduces exercise in, in diced, uh, oxidative stress in elite soccer players. The level of post-exercise creatine kinase, which is an indirect marker of mu muscle damage, was lower in astaxanthin group compared to a placebo group. But so how do we get to enjoy these impressive benefits of natural astaxanthin? Well, it is easy to use in formulation um, and does indeed have its applications beyond nutraceuticals. Um, as nutraceuticals, astaxanthin can be used in both soft gels, hard gels, and tablets. But in addition to that, it also has a wide range of application in topical cosmetic products and in functional food and functional beverages in a water dispersible form. Natural astaxanthin from Haemotococcus pluvialis generally comes in two main raw product formats that is either as a standardized oleoresin or a powder based biomass product. It has numerous uh, general benefits such as being 100% natural, non-GMO, gluten free, allergen free, and having FDAs generally recognized as safe status in the USA. And with that, I would like to hand over to Harald Turkadlsson again. Thanks again, Trigli. Now we have established that astaxanthin is good for you, both on a molecular level and in clinical studies. Uh, but how do you choose good astaxanthin? Uh, the best astaxanthin actually for your formulation. This is in effect a, an informal uh, buyer's guide for high quality astaxanthin. And of course this is going to be biased on what we think is the right way to do things. Uh, in our opinion, the three things you need to look at when deciding uh, which astaxanthin to select is the manufacturing source, the cultivation process, and of course the contamination control. Starting with the source, uh, of course you can prepare this synth synthetically via a two-fold Wittig reaction. And I personally, being an organic chemist by training, uh, think this is a very elegant approach. Uh, but I'm quite biased, as I, as I said, as an organic chemist. And also there are some drawbacks to synthetic astaxanthin, which I'll cover later. The alternative is to harvest this from nature. Uh, Arctic shrimp, for example, has about 0.1% of astaxanthin in the shell, giving it this red hue. Fafia yeast has about a percent. This can be increased somewhat through genetic modification. Or Haemotococcus pluvialis, which uh, according to Wikipedia has about 4%. We've been able to push this over 6 and we believe we can go even further. Uh, and on the bottom of the slide you see the algae, Haemotococcus. On the left is a small green cell starting photosynthesis. and going through all the cell stages, a astaxanthin filled cell on the right. Uh, but as I said, we're going to go through the sources uh, and we're going to com compare the natural versus the synthetic one. Or actually we're just going to talk about the advantages of the natural one and kind of make fun of the synthetic one in, uh, on the way. As you can see on the chemical structure, I've drawn squiggly lines, which means that there are two possibilities uh, 
two possible chemical structures, one with the chem chemistry bound up, the other with down, called diastereomers. The synthetic one has a mixture of all di diastereomers possible. The natural one, on the other hand, makes a pure 3S, 3S prime diastereomer. This is good because this uh, diastereomer has been shown to accumulate to a higher degree in human plasma. Uh, secondly, the natural one is esterified. Not only does this increase the stability of the molecule going through formulation, but it also increases the metabolic uptake of the uh, carotenoid. Thirdly, the hematococcus forms in a measurable quantity more active geometric isomers, as I've shown here. This is the 9Z and the 13Z geometric isomers of astaxanthin. Their metabolic uptake is somewhat lower than of the all-E conformer, but their antioxidant activity is far greater than the all-E conformer. And lastly, of course, uh, there's the risk of possible organic solvent residues when looking at the synthetic pathway. These aspects, or the, the three on the left, uh, these aspects explain why the natural astaxanthin from hematococcus showed a 55 times higher activity in singlet oxygen quenching, uh, as I mentioned previously. So if you now only focus on the natural astaxanthin, and more specifically, of course, only on the hematococcus-derived astaxanthin, there are, of course, different ways to cultivate this. Uh, there are two primary methods. There are, of course, more, but these are the two that are most widely spread. There's an open pond cultivation, and then there's an enclosed photobioreactor system. The pros and cons of each system I will try now to list. Uh, first of all, of course, and probably the most striking difference is the contamination. If you have an open source, open to the wind, weather, and the elements, you won't have as much control as with an enclosed system, possibly even an indoor closed system. Here we are primarily, of course, discussing biological com contamination, such as foreign algae, yeasts, mold, and bacteria. Uh, it's, like I said, it's obviously beneficial to have your algae cultivation in an enclosed system. Basically what that means, if you don't put it in, it doesn't get in. Second point is an extension of the first. Uh, by having a more rigorously defined cultivation system, the cleaning of your system both becomes much easier and more efficient. Uh, the next two points are inherently linked, the water use and the volumetric productivity, because by having closed photobioreactors, the volumetric productivity is by orders of magnitude better than in open pond cultivation. Both the astaxanthin percentage in the algae, but also a much higher algae biomass density is achieved. Basically means that if you have a 10,000 liter enclosed photobioreactor, to get the same amount of astaxanthin, you will need close to half a million liters in an open pond system. Uh, this, of course, leads to considerably lower water usage, which ties in with the sustainability, which we'll discuss later. Uh, production reliability is assured by having multiple systems, each one, of course, considerably smaller than an open pond. So even in the case of a catastrophic loss of an algae culture, or even the, the photobioreactor itself, uh, the redundancy in having multiple bioreactors means that the overall production is affected only to a very small degree. Then we get to the pros of an open pond cultivation. As the energy used in the sun, it's pretty cheap and it's relatively environmentally friendly. However, you only have 12 hours, and that's at max, 12 hours of daylight which reduces the productivity. Uh, if we keep going with the sustainable angle, for a sustainable and environmentally conscious algae cultivation in a closed system, the energy source, of course, must be renewable. That's why this smiley guy is yellow. Uh, and finally, installation cost. Uh, it's obviously going to be considerably cheaper to dig a hole in the ground than to install state-of-the-art glass, glass photobioreactors with full contamination and cultivation control. And now if we move to the sustainability, summarizing the points we've already discussed, uh, to evaluate the sustainability, we need to look at specifically these four topics, the energy source, the water source, the water use, and the productivity. The energy has to be renewable. Without renewable energy, any cultivation cannot be considered truly sustainable. Obviously, we're going to need clean water 
and we'll need it in abundant supply. However, in an effort to reduce the water we need, the higher the volumetric productivity, the better. And if we take the productivity angle a bit further, actually, looking at the in-process biologic, biological contamination control, uh, by minimizing any biologicals, productivity automatically increases. Basically, because you put in water and nutrients, if some foreign bacteria or foreign microalgae is eating up your nutrients, you won't get as much of the hematococcus as you want, and therefore, thereby you won't get as much of the astaxanthin. Now, so far in the context of this buyer's guide, we've discussed astaxanthin source, cultivation methods, and sustainability. Now we're going to move to the finalized products uh, and looking what are the criteria you as a buyer should be looking for in evaluation of the quality of astaxanthin. Uh, of course, since we're already discussing biological contamination, it, it makes sense to, to, to keep talking about them. Uh, of course, you should be looking at total aerobic microbial count, total yeast and mold count, uh, E. coli, salmonella. All of these should be absent <laughs> from your product, uh, but this is not a complete list. Uh, other parameters are, for example, heavy metals. And heavy metals are actually quite important because algae has an enormous bioabsorption cap capability. Uh, there are two recent reviews discussing this, which I urge you to check out, uh, because any trace amount of metal in the water will be sucked up by the algae. That's basically what bioabsorption capacity means. This also ties in with what I said previously, that an abundant sort of clean water, not just water, but clean water, is essential for algae cultivation. Of course, evaluation of pesticides, especially if the algae ori originates from an open pond system. Uh, dioxins, PCBs, and plasticizers are chemicals that can be extracted or leached from various plastics, such as PVC. So these, uh, you might want to check if, if these are in your product. Uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, these can also be leached from plastics, but the more likely origin of these is from the processing of the algae, because uh, excessive heating of organic material can form these carcinogenic compounds. And in the processing of algae, there is a moisture removal step. If done incorrectly or too harsh conditions, you can start producing these polyaromatic hydrocarbons another one, uh, another uh, contamination source you need to be mindful of. Now, just to make it absolutely clear, I'm not necessarily advocating that all of these, including the microbials that I mentioned earlier, are measured for every single batch of every single astaxanthin production ever. However, this is something astaxanthin producers should be aware of. And they should have evaluate, and they should evaluate the risk of all of these contaminants in the production system with risk assessments and, and whatever else is needed. Preferably, of course, they should have baseline values, and those values should be pretty darn close to zero. Uh, but that kind of brings us to the near or the end of our presentation today. But a quick summary before I hand it back to Vicky is uh, there is an endemic problem with reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress, which leads to pathological conditions. Uh, this is traced back to lifestyle, but we can address with address this with antioxidant supplements. And once you've decided to supplement, why not go for the best? Uh, but as a buyer or formulator of after products, to select the quality product, what you need to be looking at is the manufacturing source, the sustainability, and of course the contamination control. Uh, and then in the end, I promised the marketing department I would I'd give Vita Foods uh, a shout out. Uh, so if you happen to be in Switzerland next week, our booth is B52. It's an easy number to remember. Uh, so hope to see you there. With that, we conclude our regular broadcast and open the floor to questions. Well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. And now I would like to invite our audience, as Haralder said, to continue sending in your questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A portion of this webinar. We have received some questions, so I'll go ahead and get started with those. And the first question we have here is for Trigvi. And that question is, can anyone take astaxanthin? Thank you for that question, Wiki. Um, the short answer, of course, is yes. But if I elaborate on that a bit further, 
for example, that start with children. Um, well, based on the data obtained from animal and clinical research, we don't have any reason to believe that natural astaxanthin from Haemotococcus would represent a health risk. Um, and of course, it has a long history of use um, in the human diet. Um, as I mentioned during the talk as well, as it contains no allergies, or well, people with allergies um, don't have anything to worry about, worry about there. The only thing I would like to, to mention um, in relation to pregnant women taking astaxanthin, as there is some evidence suggesting that vitamin E supplementation can cause issues for pregnant women and the developing fetus. So we do therefore not recommend natural astaxanthin to pregnant women as there are no clinical studies on the subject. Thank you. Thanks for that, Trigvi. And the next question we have here is for Haralder, and that question is, why are heavy metal controls important in microalgae cultivation and astaxanthin production? Uh, hello, Vicky, again. Uh, this is actually something I covered in, in, in the presentation itself, but I can, I can reiterate if, if uh, necessary. Um, sorry. Just. So any trace amount of heavy metals in water, because there is uh, evidence that there is trace amount of, of heavy, metal, uh, heavy metals in water, and to that I actually implore people to check out the technical paper because we, we discussed this in detail. Uh, if there are heavy metals in the water, and of course cultivation of algae is water-based, the algae will suck it up at a tremendous, uh, it has a tremendous capacity to soak up uh, heavy metals. Uh, this will then carry over into your astaxanthin products. So if there are no controls for heavy metals, you are very likely to accumulate it to, to a very high extent. Great, thanks for that, Haralder. And the next question we have here is for Trigvi, and that question is, what is the recommended daily dose of natural astaxanthin, and how long does it take to work? Thank you for that question, Wiki. Um, so the first part was, what is the recommended daily dose of natural astaxanthin? Um, that ranges from 2 milligrams to 12 milligrams, depending on local regulations and application. Um, in the clinical studies, the tests have been done on, on dose sizes between 1 milligram and 40 milligrams per day. Um, like with all other carotenoids, natural astaxanthin is absorbed alongside fatty acids via passive diffusion into the intestinal epithelium. So natural astaxanthin should ideally be consumed with some dietary fats for optimal absorption. Um, and maybe just to add also that the aforementioned dose of, of 12 to 12 milligrams of natural astaxanthin is comparable to the astaxanthin consumed in, for example, a sal salmon meal. Um, as for the second part of the question, which um, related to how long it would take to work, well, in that case, the clinical data suggests that the beneficial effects um, can be observed already after taking supplements daily for four to eight weeks. For example, in the improvement of uh, skin texture and elasticity that I mentioned before. But I would also like to add that the dietary supplementation uh, might take up to 12 weeks to kick in um, for the reduction of oxidative oxidation of blood lipids. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that, Trigvi. And we do have another question for you. And that question is, is this type of antioxidant safe for long-term use? Thank you, Vicky. Um, yes, it is safe for, for long-term use. Perfect. Thank you for that, Trigby. And the next question we have here is for Haralder. And that question is, why is astaxanthin more powerful than beta-carotene? Thank you, Vicky. Uh, actually, it's, it's nice to get to uh, talk about the, uh, that a little bit more because I, only, I was only able to really like skim over uh, the in vitro studies that have been done. But it is really these hydrophilic groups on the capping rings, the beta ion rings, 
that separate the astaxanthin not only from beta carotene but basically all other uh, carotenoids or keto carotenoids having this uh, alpha hydroxy ketone on the end forms as a bridge to to the cell surface rather than only the cell uh, interior or cell the surface of the cell membrane rather than only the interior uh, as well as having the ketones at the end, it actually extends the pi system there by making it an even more potent antioxidant. So it's it's a combination of effects, but it all ties back to the unique structure of the capping rings, the end rings of astaxanthin. Great, thank you for that answer. And the next question we have here is for Trigvi, and that question is, you talked a little bit about sustainability. What environmental controls are in place at Algolith? Thank you, Ricky. Well, being located in Iceland already offers enormous benefits for microalgae production and Haemotococcus pluvialis cultivation in particular. We're 100% powered by renewable energy and we use energy efficient uh, LED lights to drive the cultivation process. Um, the fact that we have access to abundant amount of extremely clean water is very important and the water in Iceland never has to be chlorinated as in many other countries. Um, as for the environmental biological contamination, the local climate does not exactly favor a vibrant natural vegetation, as you might imagine. But this is actually a positive thing for us, as it means that the external bio burden is particularly low. But despite these advantages that the location brings, we still go the extra mile when it comes to environmental controls. And with a close cultivation system, high quality nutrient inputs, CGMP certified in organic soil and tree processing and state-of-the-art analytical capacities, we make sure that quality comes first. Perfect. Thanks for that, Trigvi. And I think the last question we have here is for Haralder, and that question is, you mentioned various chemical compounds, such as PCBs, that could contaminate algae-derived products. Has Algolif measured these compounds in its own products? Uh, yes. Uh, for the absolutely blunt answer, we, we probably wouldn't have mentioned them if we haven't measured them. Uh, but this, as well as with the heavy metals, we 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 have detected once uh, PCBs. No, no polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Sorry, uh, but other well below the the uh, limits set with regulations. But other than that, we've never actually had a measurable quantity of of any of these. But of course, we routinely check them. Uh, but as I said, I mean, we probably wouldn't have mentioned them if, if we had some sort of problems with contamination. That's kind of what, what we think sets us apart, that we, we have the, the, the cleanest product we've seen, at, at least so far. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for those answers. We have reached the end of the Q&A portion of this webinar. However, if you do have any further questions, please direct them to the email address showing on your screen, and that is sales at algolif.com. And thank you, everyone, for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from xtalks.com with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen and your participation is greatly appreciated as it will help us to improve our future webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speakers Trigvi Stephenson and Haraldur Gardeson and we hope you have found this conference informative. Have a great day everyone.